Hey everyone, my name's Andy. I'm from the Finding Value Finance channel. Today, we are blessed to have Scott with us. He's from Sill and Reap Capital. I saw that. You, you look quick. He said blessed, yeah. Uh, so there's one thing that I've noticed in the markets. Uh, the markets are selling off. Everything's kind of selling off around us. Uh, and I mean everything. And usually when you look backwards and you look at the paradigm behind us, um, we would see that everything would sell off and people would run to safety. And the perceived safety was bonds. They'd run into bonds. So we have a crash, you know, 2008 was the crash. Bonds started to decline in bond prices or yields were coming down. Bond prices were going up before that crash. We saw that again in the 2000, 2001 crash of the NASDAQ bubble. And we saw that before all these different crashes in history. But what do we see today, Scott? Do we see a, a deflationary type crash? Why are bonds, bond prices tanking and yields surging higher? What What's going on with that? I mean, that this isn't like- so we, For me, yeah. mm -hmm. for me, this is simple fact for the bond holders, right? Because obviously what bond holders want, if you're holding bonds, you want positive yields. So what, it, what typically happens is, if you look at this period, this is the comparison between, so what's in uh, pink line here is the, the United States inflation rate. So this pink line here is the inflation rate. The yellow line is the Fed funds rate. And what you see during, let, let's ignore everything else, but if you just focus on the 1970s, for example, obviously we don't have the bond data that goes back until then, but you can kind of assume that the Fed funds rate follows US 2E anyway. Um, as you can see between uh, see here um, with a close correlation, how closely. So this blue line here is a US two year. You can see that the Fed funds rate pretty much follows exactly what the US two year does. Um, so you can kind of assume what the bond market was doing back in, uh, back here. So what happens is in a highly inflationary environment, which, it, which was the 1970s, the inflation rate went up and you can see a little bit of lag between <laughs> the inflation and the, and the Fed funds rate catching up to the inflation rate. And what that simply means is bondholders, I think, want, uh, want positive return on bond, bonds that they hold. And so until and unless the bond rate, right, the Fed funds rate or the US two-year rate is higher than the inflation rate, they just dump it. <laughs> they keep dumping their bonds until the bond is yielding them at least the rate of inflation, which is what we see, what we saw back in the 1970s during the high, highly inflationary period. Okay, let's have a look at what we've got now. So you've got the US inflation rate in pink line here. You've got, and this is what we mean by behind the curve, right? Because the bond rate, the Fed funds rate is way behind the rate of inflation, which means the Fed, the bond market is behind the curve behind, behind inflation. And also the Fed is sitting here which is, this is the gap. This is the gap between the bond market US two year, which it ultimately needs to catch up to. So Fed is behind the curve <laughs> when you compare it to the US two year. So what I think will happen in a free market. So, so you can screw this up by um, having the Fed interject and print a bunch of money and buy up bonds, right? Because obviously that, that will artificially drive down the bond prices. But if you're just purely talking about the free market, the bond holders want positive rates. And that's that's as simple as that. And so until they get a 0% a, a return, net 0% return or positive return on their bonds, they will be dumping bonds because why would you want to hold <laughs> something that's depreciating in value and that, that's not even yielding a positive real return. So I think that's what's happening. I think, they, uh, I think the bond prices and the Fed funds rate will continue to, bond, sorry, bond yields and Fed funds rate will continue to go up until it catches up to the rate of inflation, until and unless the Fed and the central banks around the world interject and print a bunch of money and buy up their own bonds. Now, they're kind of in a bad situation right now, right? So we, we, we just showed that inflation is way greater than your bond yields, which gives you what's called a real negative rate. Uh, so when you have a real negative rate, you have negative purchasing power on your bonds, which then means you sell the bonds until that rate becomes positive. Now, my, my question with all of this is, will the, the movements in the interest rates actually stop inflation? 
or is this already baked into the cake? What's your opinion there? So, so the inflation that's measured by CPI, I don't think we will still come down. There are major factors that contribute to this. Obviously, energy is the largest input cost. I know we've got a bit of drawdown in oil prices, for example, and natural gas prices, but we've got winter coming. We've got SPR release that's going to stop in October. I think they are uh, starting to maybe talk about or think about doing a second or another round of SPR release, but we'll be in big trouble. I, I, don't, I don't think the military, the US military will allow that. Um, and we've just got like this huge energy crisis in Europe. So in winter, they will be in need of massive energy. So I, I just don't think, unless we see a downward pressure in energy prices, which I don't think we'll see because of the factors I've just mentioned, I don't think we'll see inflation come down. So there's one factor. And another factor I think that contributes to CPI number and particularly higher than what we've seen in 2008. Obviously, we had the QE program back in 2008. Where did that money go? That went into housing. That went into, you know, general equities and so on, right? Because it was through the banking system that, you know, obviously it was larger, large purchases of mortgage-backed securities back in 2008, which was the QE program. But this time around, it was literally the, U uh, the, the US Fed printing a bunch of money, giving it to the U.S. Treasury, U.S. Treasury giving it to another government agency and government agencies handing out money, helicopter money, dropping money, which is why we see such a high level of uh, uh, um, uh, high level of uh, cash in the deposit accounts of households and non-profit organizations, as we've talked about multiple times, which is sitting at like $4.7 trillion now for households, which is just insane and unimaginable. I think back in 2007, just before the financial crisis, it was sitting at something like 85 billion. So it's like 50 times higher than 2007 level. So I think the, the readily uh, available cash that can be used to purchase food, energy, um, pay rent, and things like that will drive inflation prices higher as measured by CPI. So I, I don't think we're going to see inflation come down anytime soon. I think we've got a bit of a pause now just because obviously I think a big factor is the SPR release. And I think as soon as that picks up and as soon as the oil prices pick up, I think it will happen by, by winter. Um, I think, yeah, inflation will pick right back up. So here's, here's another question I have then. So if we get oil prices to come on back after the SPR releases, we've got the money in the system driving uh, increased levels of spending. And let's say the interest rates get to a level that puts the... Uh, the country in a bad spot because the interest payments start to get so large, you know, what, if they start doing QE quantitative easing again and start buying bonds, isn't that inflationary? And doesn't that put them in a bad situation where they can't stop the inflation? I mean, aren't they kind of in a, it, in a bad situation here stuck. now? Yes. They are, they are very much stuck between the hot rocks, right? Because obviously that is the big problem because, the big problem in terms of debt is not in the private sector anymore, right? So it used to be, so households used to have quite a lot of debt before the washout um, in, in 2008, 2009. But right now, that's not where the problem lies. It's really the public sector that's heavily indebted, which means if the rate of, um, the, if the treasury bond rates, for example, bond rates, um, US bond, uh, US treasuries rate go up quite significantly, well, Janet Yellen is in a bit of trouble, right? <laughs> He'll need to, she'll need to make a phone call to um, Jerome Powell and ask for, uh, ask for him to do something about it because how is the US going to fund their federal budget deficit? They, they simply, simply can't. So I think there will be a point where, where Janet Yellen, go, Yellen goes, no, nah, this is not feasible. We can't borrow any more money. We can't fund our fiscal uh, spending programs. And so, uh, yes, the Fed will need to interject. Uh, and interfere with the market, and they will need to start a QE program, which then starts the whole cycle again. But I think what will happen as a result of that is that I think the print, newly printed money is probably unlikely to go into uh, mortgage-backed securities because obviously it's not so much in trouble right now compared to 2008. I mean, we've got you know very low, I guess, uh, repayments, mortgage payments, as a, uh, uh, when compared to um, disposable household income, for example. So household isn't in trouble. So the mortgage-backed securities um, portfolio isn't so much in trouble. It's really just the everyday person out on the street that's in trouble, which means I think that QE money will be used in a way that, you know, we've seen like Inflation Reduction Act, for example, right? 
that's pretty much direct injection of that money into the economy. Um, if you think about it, it's used to build up strategic reserves. It's built, used to, you know, uh, uh, have a safer supplier, safer supply of uranium or nuclear fuel. And I think in the same way, um, Janet Yellen, it will it will be a fiscal stimulus. Um, I think when they start a QE program, it will get it will directly pass on to the U.S. Treasuries. They will get handed out to government agency, and they will spend in the spot that they want to. Whether it be social security program, whether whether it is, you know infl inflation reduction like two point um, so I think it will be hugely inflationary, unlike two thousand eight, because of the way that money is going to uh, rotate into certain sectors within the economy. So we've got increasing interest rates. We've got them printing money for potential projects or programs that they want to do. What can stop them? Do you think an energy crisis? could could really stop this whole mix where if we run into constraints of oil um and the reason i say this is we've got the u.s shale oil the past 10 years that's really where all the growth of oil came from in the in the in the world the majority of growth came from united states uh oil shale and what we're seeing in the oil shales are uh actually pretty bad data like like the data's coming in and it looks bad because it's starting to roll over that entire shale patch is rolling over and we're not going to get oil from there and around the world we've seen declines in oil in other countries what we've got left in the middle east is maybe a million barrels per day more uh that's what the saudis have said if they invest heavily they can maybe get a million barrels a day more now if that's the case and we see shale roll over and we have an energy crisis that is unimaginable, that we've never seen before. And we've got Russia using oil and energy as a weapon against Europe and perhaps even the United States. Could could they be successful at basically bankrupting Europe and bankrupting the United States because we have such high debt, because of the design of the system? They just put a limit on the energy and then they say, or commodities in general, and say, good luck, here's your uh, your massive inflation. Because as you print more money and as the system goes kind of vertical, you can see the debt. The debt is all going vertical in all these different countries. You need an accompanying GDP growth with it for there to be, we'll call, you know, money existence, product existence. You have to have those two things occur at the same time. But if you cap your your commodity or your energy, um, well, now you're left with just a bunch of paper money chasing nothing. So do you think that we could have problems around the world with currencies actually failing? Do you think that's a possibility? And and what do you think these countries are going to do if they start to fail? I mean, the re I'm not just making this up. Everyone, if you want to check something out, check out bond prices in Europe. They are tanking. They are going literally straight down like a rock drop. Boom. <laughs> and I, I think you're going to pull them up or whatnot. But what's going to happen is when you have constraints and energy, your bond prices will literally crash. And your yields will be inversely related to that where they go up to the moon. This here mm -hmm. is not a deflationary problem. Interest rates around the world aren't going up because of deflation. They are literally being starved of energy and products. And when you have too much money chasing too few of goods and people get scared and you think you're going to have a hyperinflation, that's what happens. That's called a hyperinflation. This, this is a fear trade. People are like afraid of losing their entire savings in bonds. So they are running away from it. Yep. That's what now, it's selling us, right? Yeah, and if they don't if they don't get energy, that currency could be toast. Yes, I agree. 100 percent so, agree. But but here's the thing though, this is all interconnected, right? It's it all interconnected. So here's here's the problem that 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 I think is coming. I could be wrong, and maybe the bond market recognizes this now. And I, I don't know if the bond market is as smart as we think they are either. So what they're seeing over there is 
uh, an energy crisis that came. And now I think they're realizing what I just described was that energy needs to be there and, and products, goods, and services in relationship to the currency that they create and the design of the system. If that doesn't exist, your bonds go to zero because it says there's no energy. This this currency is unsustaining. And then it, it feeds on itself as sellers, you know, as sellers look at it and say, okay, I, I got to sell, I'm losing money. And then, then more sellers sell and then more and more and more and it feeds on itself. It's a self-feedback loop. I think that's going to come here in the United States. So when I look at the oil shale, when I look at, and and I'm going to grab someone else who's an oil expert, I'm going to get them on here and we're going to go over this together. You know, everybody, it'll be here soon. Um, It's going to scare you a little bit because the oil that we, that we used to grow was all from U.S. oil shale. And now that is all kind of unwinding. And and I I with Russia knowing this, they they cut their energy at the great a great time because they cut it where they could cut production back and still make more money from their oil. So they could they could sell less oil and make more money as the price goes up. As we can see that oil prices are are in the short term going down from those strategic petroleum reserve releases. And I know people are getting scared because they're seeing in front of them that things are coming down they think inflation is letting off oh you just wait until after that spr release they it, this is going to get real funky because if they if they stop the spr releases we are i'm going to make a, a, an example here back when oil inventories were really low and oil prices were 100 to 110 dollars a barrel and and the inventory level came across right now we are hundreds of millions of barrels below it and declining in our inventories. We're just taking it from a different inventory called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve Release. We are something on the lines of 110, 120 million barrels below the inventory levels of where it was when oil was 100, 110 with no Russia or anything. And remember, when this starts to come down, I, I'm willing to bet that they are manipulating the price of gold, silver, and platinum. Why do I say that? Those are areas that can trigger a, a, a problem. So they're going to have to try to hold this all together. I don't know if they're in there doing it right now because the dollar's strong and the dollar, the, the, the precious metals prices priced in dollars in relationship to other currencies. Because remember, this is all a relationship. Um, it, it could be that that is a strong dollar that we're actually seeing, but that's all going to reverse and rotate. Uh, this strong dollar is not going to last forever. Yeah. And that's the, uh, strategic petroleum reserve. Yes, that's right. So this is the lowest mm -hmm. it's been, I think 40, 40 years or something like that. And this was in the article in June. Um, I think so basically you've come down all the way back to the 1980s level. <laughs> Yes. In strategic petroleum yes. reserve. And this is the extent to which they needed to go in order to suppress the price of oil prior to the mid election, uh, midterm election. So it, it, it's crazy. I think this is just like if, if people can't see that when they see oil prices drop and go and, and say it's a demand destruction, they obviously have just no idea what they're talking about because it is not demand destruction, it is a temporary band aid solution from the release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And I think the only thing that's kind of stopped, you know how we were comparing the ratios between the Dow Jones and oil? The only mm -hmm. thing that's kind of stopped the, the stone drop uh, in terms of close out of the ratio is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, in my opinion. And I think yeah. it's just going to get a lot, lot worse um, as we move forward. And I just keep coming back to the amount of liquidity available in the system. Like households have unprecedented amount of cash on the sidelines. And that cash is going to go to where it where they need it the most. It's going to be energy. It's going to be food. I mean, we've got an energy crisis right now, but I strongly do believe that we might have a food crisis coming next year um, because of all the Ukraine and Russian stuff. Um, if you if you go back to the food stats, for example, thirty percent of um, world export of wheat is from Russia and Ukraine. Um, Twenty percent uh, of world's export of corn and fertilizer are from Ru Russia and Ukraine. Um, if you look at oil, for example, Russia and Ukraine, uh, Russia alone actually produces 
as much oil as Saudi Arabia. They are one of the largest producers of oil in the world, Russia. They have the biggest natural gas reserve in the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're one of the biggest producers of natural gas. So if you, if you put everything into context and think about where we are, where the Western world is right now, it is crazy. And, and I think just going back to your point around GDP as well, it's, um, I mean, the, the simplest way to look at it is Germany. Let's take Germany, for example. And if we look at the, uh, if we look at the products that they offer, that they are very renowned for, obviously you've got Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Volkswagen, and things like that, the car companies, right? That if you don't have energy, you produce nothing. If you're producing nothing, who's going to want your currency? No one. Your currency is going to absolutely collapse. And that's, that's, it's so simple if you think about it like that. So energy is what supports the currency. I used, I, I used to think it's gold and silver and everything else, but even before that, uh, it's all energy. <laughs> if you mm. don't have energy to produce your goods and services, you've got absolutely nothing. Um, and so I think countries like, even, even in Asia, like you know, Korea, which is where I'm from, Japan, um, all, the, all these countries that are very heavily reliant on energy, if you think about it, they're in big trouble. I think, I mean, I mean those type of, the Asian countries like Korea, as I said, Japan, I think we might be in big trouble um, because we are so heavily reliant on others to produce the commodities for us, including energy. And if we don't have it, then what are we going to do? There's nothing much we can do. We can't produce, we can't manufacture. Um, so, so I think it's going to be a wild ride for a lot of different countries around the world. So here, here's the question I have then. If we're all kind of struggling, if we've got inflation, we've got these problems, uh, it's rooted in energy. How do we solve it? What's what's the solution here? And and if we're seeing oil shales and some of this oil stuff start to roll over, that means oil's off the table worldwide yes. in terms of Nuclear. increasing volume growth. So what what it kind of leads to is a and you have, if you have commodities that are tight, if we're coming into a tight commodity market balance amongst a bunch of different commodities, this thing is aiming all at nuclear. It has to. All at nuclear. It is. It is. And that's why, you know, Japanese prime minister, the Korean president, like all these guys are just panicking and they're like, build nuclear, restart nuclear. And that's why, yeah. because they see it. Everything's supported by energy. And if you don't have it, you're going to, you're going to be a big loser. And you know what? I think they're going to be, they're going to realize the, the severity of relying on other countries to supply energy. And I think they're just going to be stockpiling, stockpiling like there's no tomorrow. They're going to be stockpiling as much uranium as possible. They're going to be stockpiling everything that they can. Um, so I think, I think it, it I think the amount of money that's going to come into the space, um, the energy space more generally, and also, you know, more specifically uranium, I think it's going to be blow everyone's mind. That's what mm -hmm. I think. And, and when people panic about like, how, how much did it decline by when everyone panicked? Like 7% or something like that? When everyone's panicking about 7% decline, obviously they don't see what we see, Andy. Yeah, I know. There's no yeah. room to panic. There's no room for panicking because I don't know. For me, the forward is like so clear. I can almost visualize it. I can touch it. I can smell it. And it's like, it's, it's just like one of the most obvious trades that I've come across. Um, so, and obviously this is not financial advice. I could be totally off. Maybe I'm insane, but um, that, that, <laughs> that's kind of what I'm looking at. <laughs> I'm just looking at this pile of money just coming right into the sector that we're invested in. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's crazy. The, the, the thing that, that scares me a little bit is I don't think we can adopt a lot of these solutions that people want as easily as what people think. And and we described it a little bit before here. Uh, we're shutting down manufacturing plants. Um, we are having problems obtaining a lot of inputs for production of, of, of things. Uh, all of these mines, all of these areas, the, the pipes and, and all that stuff for drilling, those are all things that we need in order to maintain a, a production. But as things start to break down from an energy perspective in an entire continent, almost in Europe, um, the production of a lot of these things that are needed, 
uh, aren't going to be there. They're going to be delayed. They're going to have problems. Things will slow down. So I think there's also a, a large barrier to adoption for other energy sources that maybe people are overlooking. This isn't like we're just running unabated with all of our manufacturing facilities up in the entire world with no energy constraints and then transitioning to something new. What's happening is we're trying to transition to something new with all these constraints. And it's not like I can just flip on a manufacturing facility and just run it at full power and then run it with all commodity inputs. Uh, so I think that the transition is going to be messy as heck. And as an investor, I think we have to look at that and, and see, hey, look, this is a a risk to uh, all of this. It's not it's not going to be as easy as it was in the 1970s when people were smoking in the facilities. There's just everything all it's all, you know, right there. We've got loads of iron, loads of lo loads of aluminum, loads of whatever the heck we want. It's all, you know, right there. Uh, what it's going to be is we are short five, six different things. We can't finish whatever we want to do. So, you know, as as time progresses, we don't we I don't think we can respond very quickly to this, like as quickly as we think we can. And we might try to put in these renewables. But if your energy is constrained and you have these highly complex assemblies, with millions of parts or thousands of parts uh, to make these things work. And you're highly dependent on, let's say rare earth metals, which is 99% processed in Russia or uh, in China. And they produce 70, 80, 90% of the actual raw materials as well. I mean, what makes you think that's going to be successful? And I, I don't know. I just look at this like, man, we could get in a big squeeze on the energy side. Now, if that's the case and currencies start to buckle, what should we be looking for? I mean, should we be looking at bond prices to see what they're doing? And if we start to see yields go vertical, that means they're buckling, right? Is that is that true? Would you say that's a fair statement? Or do you think that's that's normal? And what we're, what we're going to eventually see is is bond yields start to outpace inflation where people get scared. You know, like what are the signs you, you think, Scott, free market. maybe you haven't thought about it yet, where we start to see these these currencies and these um, bonds start to buckle? What 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 are you looking for? So I, I think in a free market without the, the central bank's intervention, I think the bond prices, so so the rates, the bond rates will have to outpace the rate of inflation. Um, so um, whether they whether the central banks let them do that or not is a separate matter, I think. So I think there are potentially two scenarios. One is that central banks just let it collapse because everyone's like inflation, inflation, inflation. So the central banks might be like, okay, we'll give you what you want. We'll let everything collapse and we'll wait until you cry for, for, for our help. And so that could be a potential scenario, in which case I think we're going to see mother of all crashes. Um, so I, I definitely see that as a potential uh, scenario. We'll obviously have to look at what the bond market does, what the central bank sections are. Uh, we can't predict what they're going to do, right? Exactly what they're going to do. So uh, will they let it rise? Will they let the rates rise to a, an, an unimaginable level? I think that's possible. Maybe it's not likely, but I certainly think it's possible. And I think they might give the markets what they want, which is, you know, they want, everyone wants inflation to be tapered down. So maybe the Fed's like, okay, we'll give you what you want. <laughs> we'll let everything crash and go to a deflationary pressure. Because deflationary pressure to me will be caused if we see a high, high delinquency rate, um, because that will be destroying the credit in the system um, and destroying uh, effectively the money supply within the system. So I think if, you, if we see that, we could have a deflationary or dis a very high disinflationary period. Um, however, will they let that do that? Will Yellen come and cry? Um, because nah, they won't let it happen. They're they, they probably won't. I, I, I'm kind of betting on that they won't uh, let it happen, which means that the, the bond rates will stay below the rate of inflation because it's art artificially uh, manipulated by the Fed. Um, and so that's probably the light, more likely scenario, in which case, it gives a clear green light to everyone to go hard in on uh, commodities, precious metals, and everything else. Um, so I think I think either way, commodities are going to probably go up. Um, 
when I say short term, I don't mean immediately, but I think for the foreseeable future, I think the commodities will um, outpace everything else in terms of performance. Um, and if we were to see the deflationary pressure, obviously we'll have to watch the delinquency rates and what the, what the Fed does, and we'll make our informed decision then. I think we could see a deflationary pressure if we see the delinquency rates pick up. Uh, but if the Fed steps in beforehand, obviously that gives us another set of green lights to hold on to our commodities. Um, but that's that's kind of something to think about in the medium to long term, I think. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of how this all plays out because um, obviously I'm positioned physical precious metals heavily and then energy is my other big play. Yeah. So, yeah, that's. I'm just trying to see what what do we look for if we're going to have problems and I've I've always looked at yields and bond prices and this type of crash I have got the people saying oh it's everything's going to crash it's going to be deflationary I think everything's going to crash but it's going to be from energy it's not it's not like the previous crashes where interest rates go up the demographic runs out and then we get a rollover and everybody jumps into bonds maybe it's going to be like that but if that's the case, we are way too early for that. Hmm. Yeah, so I this agree. is just market volatility, I think. Yes, I 100% I agree with that. So with with bonds, obviously, in the past few crashes, if you look at the 2000s crash, the 2008 crash, bond I mean, you saw people piling into bonds before the deflationary pressure. We're seeing right the opposite right now. Um, so that tells me that that's not going to happen. The only exception to that is in 2000, uh, sorry, 1970s, I think the bond price, so bond rates were going up at the same time that the markets came down. However, if you look at that period, of, once again, the gold prices and the gold stock prices went up as the markets were tanking. Um, and, and same with the oil price. Oil price was going up while the stock markets were tanking. So in either scenario, regardless of you know whether we apply the 2000 or 2008 scenario or the 1970s scenario, the place to be for me is commodities and specifically energy and and precious metals. And I think we're closer to the time frame of 1970s than we are of 2000, 2008, because the interest rates are obviously breaking a long term downtrend, which is is ending that disinflationary environment of 40 plus years. From 1980 all the way till uh, 2020, so that's um, that was the disinflationary period. We've broken that long-term downtrend, and we are setting ourselves up for a a 1940s plus 1970s type environment, where you have higher rates of inflation, you have higher interest rates, uh, and the demographics are similar. I so I think it's just all more similar to that time frame but we've got all this debt and that debt is going to be a problem and i think if they try to do anything with it it's going to be inflationary any sort of manipulation yeah. of currencies any sort of or manipulation of currencies and or debt in terms of trying to manipulate uh yields or anything like that it's all going to be inflationary it, it, it's going to do the exact opposite of what they want as an outcome yes so yes so, so this was this is what I'm talking about here. So when I said the gold mining index actually went up while the stock prices were falling, and we experienced general, you know, pretty significant drawdown in the stock market. So let's just do a measured move here. So if I just go in 1973 at the top to DJI and DJI down to the bottom on, in, in 1974 towards the end of 1974, we had we had a 46 percent drawdown in D, uh, Dow Jones in, uh, industrial average. At the same time, you can see that let's say let's say 1973 is around here on this chart, and you get 1974 gold Barron's gold mining index shot up really really hard. So this is what I'm talking about when I say there. This was a okay. Let me just overlay the Fed funds rate here for you as well. <clears throat> what what uh, percent so, gain did the Barron's kind of do there? So so. It's a rough estimate. So let's say yeah. this is around the 150-ish mark or 100 mark even, if you take the lows here, um, it gained 6x, around six times. Okay. What did, so, what did so, gold do during that time frame? Because gold went up a lot. It went from like $38 <laughs> yeah. an ounce or so in 1970 
and I don't know where it was in 74 or 5. So if I just take 1973 here, gold was at $60 per ounce, and it went up to around 192 so 200 No, so it went higher than that. Three... It went to 850 Oh, no, in... yeah, 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 yes. So at, two, at the... Uh, at the end of okay, the yeah, decade. you're looking at okay, okay, you're looking at the mid. At so the 74 it went to yeah. 100 and it 100, went to uh 180ish or 200. So, so what's uh 180 divided by 30 something, isn't it? I uh, no, it was 60. So it's about 3x in gold oh, price. Oh, 3x. And, uh, yes, and 6x gotcha. in the gold uh, the Barron's gold mining index. Um and this is the this is what I'm talking about here. So obviously this is a time where interest rates were rising yet the stock markets were falling uh, which is not which is different to 2000 and 2008 where mm -hmm. it would have, you would have seen the opposite to that so but what i'm trying to point out is whether you take it doesn't matter if, if you take the 2000 or 2008 scenario or the 1970s scenario what this is telling us is that we need to be in commodities <laughs> regardless yeah. of which scenario we, we take into account so that's the conclusion that i'm drawing here yeah, I think the stock market is going down because interest rates are going up. And I think the money will eventually rotate into commodities. Now, everyone's going to say, how come it's not already doing that? How come it's not, it's not, you know, we're not seeing oil prices go up and other prices. I think it's all SPR release and we'll see what happens here. But um, there's huge problems in the physical market. We are way short. And if I were to put a number on where oil prices would be based off inventory, I would say it should be somewhere between 100 and 150 right now. And that's only going to get worse. It's not getting better. The demand is continuing to eat through our inventories. So whenever you have a disconnect between the market and the inventory and physical market, that's your opportunity. Boom. That's it. It's not, it's not uh, something to be worried about. It means that there's there's a problem and that problem will overrule. The physical markets will always overrule the paper markets when inventories get to a certain spot or you start to see shortages in the market. If you start to see shortages in the market, then you know this thing is 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 rigged, so to speak. <laughs> and if it's rigged, then you better start protecting yourself in other ways. That's my, my That's thought. Fine. Yes, in yes. Other ways being physical metals or something like that, because they will uh, they will seek their their true value in society. And I don't know where where people are going to run if we have these bond type collapses. And credit is what makes a lot of these things go round the the earth because like people get credit and then they build infrastructure, they do these things, and it could get pretty nasty if uh, you get a a currency crisis. So. We can watch uh, Europe to see kind of what's going on in Europe, and we can use that as a prelude of what could happen to other areas if we see similar problems. So do you have anything else, Scott? Anything else you'd like to add? No, not really. I think, no. um, I mean, I mean, it's probably worth pointing out something interesting, though. Um, I did say this ages ago, and I thought it just might be worth sharing. The bearish case for oil stocks. Mm -hmm. You might want to consider this. Um, I don't want to just go mega bullish everything, but if you look at the oil stocks between this period here, the oil stocks actually did go down. So this is ExxonMobil, for example. So oil prices were going up, I think, believe, during this period. So let me just overlay the oil chart here. And this is why I'm not massively in oil right now. Part of the reason, I mean, obviously, oil price didn't shoot up here. It stayed, stayed flat. But... It did come down. So this is ExxonMobil once again. It did come down with the oil price. Uh, so sorry, sorry, the general drawdown in general equities. So I mean, if you're looking for a bear bear case for oil stocks in particular, or well, there there's your bear bear case. Um, but yeah. once again, oil didn't oil didn't really go up or do anything here. So you know, it kind of does make sense that if the commodity is is staying flat, relatively flat during the period, it does make sense that it will sell off with the general equities. So. Yeah, I think back then they were uh, highly in a lot of the indexes. Energy made up like mm -hmm. 20 or 30% of 
the uh, Dow Jones or or the S and P five hundred, and I think from ESG measures, they've kind of taken all those out, a lot of them. So the yep. impact of the overall markets may be less on some of these oil companies because of the ESG and and the the amount of um, large funds that don't. I don't think they're as weighted in the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S and P five hundred anymore. That's one thing to think of too. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. But nice yeah. observation, Scott. I like it. Yeah. Just in just in case you want a bear case. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, well, that's all I've got. Is that all you've got, Scott? Yes, that's yep. it. Um all right, so we um okay, that's it. So let's blend it there. Uh thanks for coming yes. on, Scott. If you guys haven't checked out his channel or his Twitter, definitely go check it out. Uh, you can check mine out too if you'd like, and uh, we'll catch you next time. So thanks for uh, for for visiting. If you've made it to the end, uh, what should we say? What should we put in the comment section for if you've made it to the end, Scott? Nuclear power is the future. Nuclear power is the future. Put it in the comment section. All right, guys. We'll catch you next time. It's finding value. See you later. Bye.